Does training to failure have a negative impact on your overall strength? We're gonna dive deep into training to failure and what that means for your own training. And we're gonna start right now. When I've coached at the Olympics, Twice. When I've been to a dozen different world championships, some of the big factors that I've seen around the best coaches in the world is how they can take research and then apply that into training and then apply that in a sports specific setting. And that's what we're gonna do here today is that we're gonna break down a recent paper that came out in this month, July 6th of 2024. And this is gonna be a meta-analysis to look at what happens when you train close to failure. What happens when you start to back off from failure? What are the things that actually tend to occur with size of muscle mass? And then also what happens with overall strength? And then how we can apply all of these different findings. Recently this past year, there was a paper about power lifters and their muscle mass having essentially a direct correlation to how much strength they had in their specific lifts, the back squat, the bench press, and the deadlift. Then there's another recent paper that came out discussing the speed of movement, okay? So how quickly a movement is being executed, determining how far away that would then be from failure, and then how that can correlate to a massive amount of strength. And so we've got to look through those lenses right there and say, okay, this paper over here about the speed of the movement clearly has a role in overall strength gains. This paper over here that talks about muscular size also has a role in overall strength expressions, okay, in, in the sense of the powerlifting scenario. So we're gonna look at this paper here uh, from July of this year, 2024, exploring the dose response relationship between estimated resistance training proximity to failure, strength gains, and muscular hypertrophy. Okay, so let's start off with the background here, the proximity to failure in which sets are terminated. I wish they would just put this in lay people's terms. So the, the closeness that you get to failure, let's say we're doing a set of seven. We have a prescribed set of seven, or let's just say that we don't have a prescribed set of actual reps. We're just looking at this as far as like, failure is when I can't do a single rep. We can use the theory of, let's say I'm, I've got 100 kilos and I can do, in my mind and, and based off of past experience, 100 kilos I can do 10 reps of whatever exercise. But if I stop that at six, okay, my proximity to termination would be those four remaining reps. So think about that. When sets are terminated, it's gained a lot of attention uh, and it can be a potential key for resistance training variables. Okay, so multiple different meta-analysis have directly failure versus not failure or indirectly velocity loss, alternative set uh, structures evaluated the effect of proximity to failure on strength and muscular hypertrophy. So in this case, they're separating strength as how much force can be applied into the barbell versus muscular hypertrophy is the actual growth of the muscle, you know, the muscle cell structure, right, altogether. So, uh, however, the dose response effects of proximity to failure have not been analyzed. So the dose, how much, how frequently, how much of this is actually occurring in a continuous manner. So to meta-analyze the aforementioned areas of relevant research, they're gonna be looking at uh, reps in reserve, which I actually think in my opinion, uh, is theoretically much better in, than, than RPE. I even believe that reps in reserve is actually what people use in an auto-regulatory system. So in our training system here at Garage Strength, before I could put a verbal label to it, reps in reserve, I would train athletes and I would theoretically know or internally know, okay, this athlete could probably do two or three more reps. Okay, if this athlete could do two or three more reps, this is what that means. Okay, this is what we're gonna do with the next set. And ironically, that's actually how we set up our strength training structure inside of our strength training at peak strength. So it's entirely based off of this system of auto-regulation where we look at it, you inform the actual app on how that felt, and then the app then makes decisions based off of the education that we've provided towards it. So importantly, the RIR associated uh, with each effect in the analysis was estimated on the basis of the available descriptions of the training interventions. Okay, so data was extracted. I always think it's funny too, data were extracted as though they were human beings, but let's that's fine. Uh, data was extracted in a series of exploratory multi-level meta regressions were performed for outcomes related again, both to strength and hypertrophy. And then they put them through a sensitivity analysis and with multiple different models with the for the effects of load, equating volume, and then duration of intervention and training status. And I think actually making sure that when we're looking at 
how close are we getting to failure in a specific set? Are we very close or are we further away? And then making sure that the volume is equated. I think when we see that volume is equated, it makes it much easier to actually comprehend the adaptations that are occurring. So the results here, the best fit models for both strength and muscular hypertrophy outcomes demonstrated modest quality of overall fit. In all of the best fit models for strength, the confidence intervals of the marginal slopes for estimated RIR contained a null point estimate, indicating a negligible relationship with strength gains negligible relationship with strength gains. So in this case, we've just got to realize that if we're getting closer to failure, let's say we're right up against the, the wall of failure or we're, we're not getting that rep at all. This could potentially have a negative effect on strength gains, okay? But it's not going to have like zero adaptations. That's something we just have to be aware of as strength coaches is like, what's occurring in this case. In all of the best fit models for muscular hypertrophy, the marginal slopes for estimated RIR were negative and their confidence intervals did not contain a null point estimate indicating that changes in muscle size increased as sets were terminated closer to failure. That's very interesting. Muscular hypertrophy increases, muscular size increases, the closer we get to failure. I think it's really important for us to understand that there's also research that teaches us that muscular size has a high correlation to force output. In theory, the larger a muscle is, the more force it can put out. Now there is a point of diminishing returns, which we've also seen, but typically that's pretty far down the line. So let's just keep that in perspective here, look at conclusions and then help you guys apply this. Cause I think this is really interesting to sort of pull from all these different papers and then think through what that means. So dose response relationship between proximity to failure and strength gain appears to differ from the relationship with muscular hypertrophy with only the latter being meaningfully influenced by RIR. So muscular hypertrophy uh, is highly influenced by RIR, that very tight failure range. Strength gains were similar across a wide range of RIR while muscle hypertrophy improves as sets are terminated closer to failure. Big aspect there, you wanna get huge, okay, like super yoked up, we need a lot of sets of fail to failure. Think about volume equation. If we are equating total volume, so let's say that we're doing 100 sets, or yeah, let's just pretend we're doing 100 sets over three months, okay, and it would probably be higher than that, but let's just pretend that we're doing 100 sets over three months. If we do more sets to failure than not, okay, so let's say we do 70 sets to failure, we will have substantial muscular size gains. So size, will we will grow quite a bit if we are truly pushing to failure. If we have more of those 100 sets pushing, you know, five reps away from failure, four reps away from failure, we will have more strength gains, especially, especially if the velocity or the intent is higher. And that goes into some of these other papers that we've discussed recently. So considering the RIR estimation procedures used, uh, the exact relationship between RIR and muscular hypertrophy and strength still remains a little unclear. Uh, researchers and practitioners should be aware that optimal proximity to failure may differ between strength and muscle hypertrophy outcomes. I also think some muscles might fail a large amount of reps later than other areas, but cautions warranted when interpreting the, the present analysis because it's exploratory and we need to have future studies. Okay, so what does this mean? I think the biggest aspect is we still need to, to look back and think through this is a dose response relationship okay so they're equating us and, and oftentimes uh, what we'll do I like to use drop sets okay I like to use potentiation sets anything along those lines I think a lot of this can also be seen through the light of rest okay rest period so if we look at rest as essentially is this rest period potentiating the next set, meaning it's gonna make the next set more effective? Is there long enough recovery to make sure that we can do the next set at a high intensity? Or is there a minimal amount of rest that is going to lead to a development of metabolites? So that's sort of like the three ways that we can look at this in the strength realm. And then when we set up our system of training, we have to recognize the rest relationship and the volume and so if we're looking at like we're doing a like six sets of bench press if five of those sets are two to three reps from failure 
and then one of those sets is to failure, we're still gonna get some type of pump out of the out of the athlete, which then might actually lead to a little bit better performance on the next grouping of exercises. But I, it's still dose response related. So those five to six sets, if more of them are done without failing, you'll be focusing on strength gains. Over time, if we say that only two sets are gonna be done without failing and then four sets are done to failure, we're not gonna make a ton of strength improvements, but we will make a large amount of muscular size improvements. And then we can do that, let's say for four to eight weeks, we can do that and then spend the next eight to 12 weeks going back to not failing, but actually increasing the, the neural innervation of the newly gained muscle mass. So that's where doing exercises like high speed plyometrics, technical coordination movements. So like a high hang snatch or a power snatch or a behind the neck jerk or a dynamic deadlift, things like that, pad benches that are very, very high speed will help the innervation quality of the newly gained muscle mass. So if we have an athlete that needs to get bigger or just get heavier or go up a weight class, if they're in a weight class sport, we can use this to our advantage to help them gain that muscle mass quicker. They have to fail a lot more frequently, which can be taxing mentally and also means that they need to be focusing a lot on their nutrition and their sleep as well. So the most important aspect here, in my opinion, is just recognizing the sets of failure. Okay, what are we gonna get out of them? Also, what that means in relationship to our rest periods, okay? And then what that means in the grand scheme of things in the entire system. But the baseline is that if you want to get stronger, fail minimally. You know, it's still okay if you fail one or two sets if you're doing six plus sets, right? But if you're really trying to get as big as possible, this is where you're gonna think about like the old school bodybuilding videos where you're just cranking reps, cranking reps, cranking reps until you cannot move anymore. Then you rest for a minute, you let the metabolites clear a little bit, but not entirely, and then you go again. And I do believe there's a point, even in an athlete's career, to do training along those lines because of the mental strength that they end up gaining which then enables them to do heavier weights closer to failure, but not actually failing later on. And a lot of this comes back to like that contextual style periodization. And that's what we use inside of our strength training at peak strength. If you guys need help with increasing your sports specific speed, your explosiveness, your endurance, and your strength, head over to peakstrength.app, the Google Play Store, or the Apple iOS Store. You can download Peak Strength today. Select the specific sport that you're training for, and then that's gonna lay out a specific program catered to your needs and your goals. Because remember, freaks, if you wanna become a champion, you've always gotta cultivate your power. Peace.